Um, thanks to the uh, Economic and Social Research Council. Uh, thanks to um, Al Bovis, uh, Liz Pelicano, and Lorcan Kenny, and many others um, who uh, helped make my trip to London possible. I have very fond uh, feelings about London, uh, both because one of my uh, uh, daughters is a student this year in London, and also because uh, probably the greatest achievement, one of the greatest achievements that my daughter, Isabel, uh, who is autistic, um, has made uh, in recent years is to travel by plane alone to London and uh, and then use Uber while here to do touristy things like go to the Tower of London or the, uh, the zoo. So um, I'm really, really pleased to be here and I'm so lucky. I've been to London five or six times and every time it's been nice weather. So <laughs> I know now having said that, it's all downhill from here. Um, the um, the title of my talk is The Changing Values of Autism. What you saw in the title that was distributed was an evening with Professor Grinker, and I, so I feel with that title you should all have glasses of red wine, we should have a, a roaring fire, and I should have an acoustic guitar and, and, and be you know, serenading you. Um, so I, I, I fear that uh, uh, it, it will, this presentation will be a little um, more um, sharp. Uh, than um, that kind of relaxed um, setting, particularly because um, I have some things to say that um, uh, might involve statistics and things of that sort, which um, hopefully will uh, be at a pace that's enough for you to digest and that my slides won't have so much information that it'll be difficult for you to follow. Uh, so I have, uh, as Liz said, had a long interest in the intersection between culture and mental health and, and the and interest in, in the intersection between culture and uh, illness. Uh, my great-grandfather, my grandfather, and my father were all psychiatrists and psychoanalysts. Uh, and I was, of course, supposed to be the fourth generation. I, quite a disappointment. But, uh, my father, uh, who's still alive and is in his 90s, um, at the height of his career in the 1960s and 1970s, uh, he believed strongly that homosexuality was a mental illness. He thought homosexuality should be cured. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to be hypercritical of my own father, who's a wonderful, wonderful person. But he was a man of his times, and he was a doctor of his times. After all, the American Psychiatric Association, until the, uh, the early 1970s, had included homosexuality as a mental illness category. It was a mental illness because homosexual behaviors, as they were called, or even homosexual thoughts, caused people so much distress. Every so-called homosexual my father encountered, closeted or not, was anxious, depressed, often marginalized from families, or living a partly secret life. And he once said, I've never met a happy homosexual. Well, he genuinely thought that people would be happy if they were heterosexual. There was not at this time a clear understanding that distress caused by conflict between an individual and his or her society should not constitute mental illness, but should lead us to question the society in which we live. And it was only when a brave new president of the American Psychiatric Association named John Spiegel, who, by the way, was my grandfather's best friend and possibly his lover during World War II, joined with many other closeted gay psychiatrists, all of whom were married with children and grandchildren, to eradicate homosexuality from the DSM. And the reason why I'm opening with this discussion of homosexuality is because we don't think of it today, largely, uh, in most circles in industrialized societies as constituting an illness or constituting uh, a disease. Um, homosexuality is not considered that way anymore, in large part because of changes in society. And the question of what constitutes any mental illness continues to vex us today because society doesn't stay still. Society is dynamic. Though in professional circles, a mental illness continues to be defined as a pattern of behaviors or thoughts associated with significant distress or disability in one's life. There remain debates 
about what kind of experiences, what kinds of thoughts and behaviors should constitute an illness. Mental illnesses, with a few exceptions, like post-traumatic stress disorder, bereavement disorder, uh, reactive attachment disorder, continue to be idiopathic. They do not have a known cause. Down syndrome, for example, is not considered a mental illness. It is defined in terms of a specific etiology. It's an extra copy of chromosome 21. Even if comorbid psychiatric disorders might be associated with it. Though, as I'll mention later, even this has changed. And over the past few years, I've been trying very hard in my reading and my teaching and my writing to, to stop seeing autism as exceptional, apart from the rest of psychiatry. Trying to imagine what autism's futures are by comparison to other conditions, or supposed conditions, such as homosexuality. And there is a reason why we should consider autism within the larger structure of categories that we use today. And it is that some of these categories come and go. Look at Asperger's disorder, which has been eliminated as a clinical diagnosis. And we should do this. We should perform this kind of operation of putting autism in a larger context of categories that we use because the same discipline that created the concept of autism created the other concepts as well. And if we want to understand autism as a dynamic concept, we have to understand the processes through which it emerged and changed. And in this talk, I, I want to discuss the changing values of autism, by which I really mean the changing definitions, but in the context of the process by which, at a particular historical period, knowledge becomes ordered in a new way. It becomes ordered as a form of governance that operates according to a largely economic logic. But as I said, I want to make sure that in your minds right now, you're situating <laughs> our thinking about autism in the same context as other psychiatric conditions. And in order to do that, I want to show you a couple of examples. <coughs> Things that will help you to see, even if you already know this, but perhaps to reaffirm it, will, will help you to see the way in which uh, autism <coughs> is constructed, and if constructed, can be changed. Take a disorder like post-traumatic stress disorder. The cluster of symptoms that constitute post-traumatic stress disorder do not exist in the historical record until the Vietnam War. In fact, the British military doesn't have much mention of flashbacks, which are a hallmark of post-traumatic stress disorder until 1990 or 91. And the symptoms from the past frameworks of trauma, like shell shock, are largely missing today. Let me uh, show you uh, quickly a video of what shell shock or war trauma looked like uh, after World War I or during World War I. It consisted of symptoms such as contorted body uh, uh, structure, contorted body movements. It consisted of paralysis, loss of speech, things that are not today part of what we see as post-traumatic stress disorder. Today, the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder are different from those they were in the past. Not only in the present do we not see these sort of body contortions, but in the past, in World War I, we didn't have flashbacks recorded, or a hyperarousal, or traumatic memory, or late onset, delayed onset trauma symptoms, nor did the medical establishment include within the category of trauma things that today we do, such as uh, incest and sexual violence. So here is what post-traumatic stress disorder looked like in World War I. Sorry about the 
So the reason I show you that is because I want to make the point that the cluster of symptoms that today would constitute PTSD is very different from that which constituted the discussion of psychiatric and psychological and emotional trauma many years ago. Now, why is that the case? That something looks so different now than it did in the past. We only have to look at autism, homosexuality. We can even look at schizophrenia. There's nothing in the literature from uh, the ancient world that looks like schizophrenia. But I doubt very much that schizophrenia is a brand new condition. Let's look at uh, something else, like homosexuality. It's new. In 1892, you have the first usage of the word homosexual, and homosexuality first appears in the Oxford English Dictionary in 1976. So what does that mean? Before that time, was there no homosexuality? Absolutely, there was no homosexuality before 1892. Did men have sex with men for as long as we know? Yes. Did women have sex with women? Yes. But it wasn't necessarily separated out as a distinct category of personhood or of behavior. So, in ancient Greece, when men had sex with men, there was no categorical distinction between appropriate same-sex sex and uh, appropriate heterosexual sex. Therefore, we cannot say that there was something that is homosexuality. Today, homosexuality is a construct that defines a person, reflects an inner disposition, is glossed in many ways as being either a choice or grounded in biology. And so it becomes very difficult to talk about what these things were in the past. And how many times in this, I wonder how many of you have ever been asked, if you're in, very interested in autism, or you study, or you're autism specialists, if you've been asked if there was autism in you know, ancient Greece, or if there was autism in the 1600s. I get asked all the time, because autism feels so new to us. And there was no autism in the past. Were there people who didn't speak? Yes. Were there people who had the kinds of uh, behaviors that today we associate with autism? Yes. But these categories are fundamentally ways of organizing heterogeneous elements into a shared pattern. And when that shared pattern that is in the concept fits with our experience and what we see, then that category seems real. And so that's why it's both so difficult for us to question the mental illness categories we have today, and why it's so hard to wrap our head around the idea that there might not have been homosexuality in the past. It becomes especially difficult to talk about whether somebody who had same-sex relations or love relationships in the past constituted somebody who was gay. So, you know, was Lincoln gay? There's a big, big debate about this stuff. He loved a man named Joshua Speed for three years. They lived in the same place. They slept in the same bed. They wrote love letters to each other. They talked about how afraid they were of performing sexually uh, with their wives. Lincoln never had to worry about being called gay. He never had to worry about being called gay because there was no concept of homosexuality. Obviously, people had to worry about lots of things. It wasn't approved of. In the 1500s, after King Henry VIII passes in 1533 the anti-buggery law, you can bet people who were engaged in same-sex sex had to worry that they might be executed. But it wasn't that they had to worry about being considered a different or a discreet kind of person. And given that that was the case, it changed behavior. And this is the important thing to note here, that when we have these concepts, like homosexuality, autism, whatever it might be, they are never isolated just to the concept. They have a social and cultural life. They change the way in which we live. All you have to do is look at how much affection, physical affection there was between men before the concept of homosexuality. And just as a, 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 a little you know, reminder of this in an illustration, um, let's see. Thank you.
there's the there's a 19th century baseball team. Everybody's sort of hanging around each other, the arms around each other. And uh, here's my university's um, baseball team today. <laughs> you got to be very, very careful. So what does it mean to say that a particular kind of condition has a social and cultural life? Well, we know that mental illnesses are not diagnosed by lab tests. We have no scan or blood test or thing that you can see in a microscope. But even the most clearly identifiable medical illnesses require interpretation. The vast majority of diagnoses that doctors give to their patients are not based on lab tests so much as or identifying a particular virus or bacterium, but on a, uh, an assessment, an interpretation. I think you've got a virus, go home. I think you've got a bacterium, take this broad-based antibiotic. I have no idea what the bacterium is, but we don't need to know. So even medical illnesses require interpretation. And plus, even medical illnesses require that, not require, but create a new set of conditions. They're not restricted to some kind of fact under a microscope. You might say, oh, breast cancer, if there's a tumor, and we can look at the tumor under a microscope, and we can see the abnormal cells, and that's a fact. But how little, it's amazing how little that tells us about the power of what something does. A woman is diagnosed with breast cancer, her finances may change. Her relationship with a, her husband or her children may change. There were maybe friends who she thought were close and they're freaked out and anxious and they're more standoffish than she would want. There are other people who weren't close friends who suddenly seem to be the most close and generous and loving people who step forward and so her social landscape changes. If the woman lives in a society in which the breast is strongly associated with femininity, she might even see herself differently as a woman. And none of that is under the microscope. None of that is written in the cells of a tumor. And we want to do the same thing with autism. We want to understand that everything exists within a culture and a history. So when we talk about the value or values of autism. What do we mean by value? Value generally refers to something's worth. And worth is ascertained in comparison to some standard of equivalence, often a numerical measure, like dollars or pounds, euros or yen. There are numerous other concepts of value as well that are not so easily measured. There is the value of a sound, a musical note, a color, an education, a marriage, an invited lecture. Some guy named Grinker talked last night. Is it valuable? But no matter how we think of it, value is fundamentally derived from its position within a system of meaning. This semiotic conception of value highlights the arbitrariness of any phenomenon. If its meaning derives from its relationship to a structure or a system, then it has no intrinsic or inherent meaning. Language is perhaps the best example of this positioning. Since sounds, words, and groups of sounds and words acquire meaning only in relation to others. Onomatopoeia, where a word sounds like what it is, like buzz for the sound of a bee flying around, is something that plays only the tiniest role in the construction of language. There's nothing, for example, in the sound of horse that we would immediately say is intrinsic to it that associates it with a four-legged mammal that, it comes, that comes to mind. Horse stimulates in us a sound image or concept because the sound of the H, or the H followed by other sounds, exists in relation to other meaningful sounds like C or F that are not H, which would create coarse or force. So the word horse, just as you know, example off the top of my head, acquires meaning because it is different from these other terms and because it is different from, say, a zebra 
or a donkey. So when we come to a disease construct, it makes sense to perform the same kind of mental operation. This means we don't assume that there is such a thing as autism outside of a larger system of which it is a part and for which it depends on its existence and meaning. Now, this, I should point out, is not to deny that people with what we today call autism have observable behaviors that appear to us to fit into a shared pattern. But my daughter will have challenges in social communication, uh, behaviors that she repeats, narrow interests, no matter what she's called. Constructivist approaches to health and illness, such as the one I'm describing, don't deny that there are underlying biological conditions that produce particular behaviors or cognitive challenges, cognitive skills, or suffering. Rather, constructivist approaches acknowledge that science builds models of behavior that are historically contingent, culturally constituted, and sometimes, like Asperger's disorder, temporary. The social and cultural life of the condition is most visible when it causes people great social distress, like stigma, like margin, being marginalized from access to the, both the, the family or symbolic or financial resources that a person wants. The stigma of so many diseases is decreased, and most often not because of any new scientific discovery that changed the way that we looked at a disorder, but because of the changes that occur between individuals and their societies. I recently wrote an opinion piece for the journal Autism on the continued debates over a symbol of autism that has been widely used, the puzzle piece. Anybody ever seen a puzzle piece used as a symbol of autism? Um, it's been ubiquitous, and not just because it's the symbol of one of the larger organizations, Autism Speaks. Remember, this publicly uh, recognizable symbol of autism was first used in 1963 in the UK by the newly established National Autistic Society, an organization founded by parents and modeled on a previous organization called the Spastic Society of Children with Cerebral Palsy. The logo, as you know, now no longer used by the NAS, was designed by a parent of an autistic child named Gerald Gasson, and it was a puzzle piece, a jigsaw puzzle piece, that had the image of a child crying. He did this to illustrate both that autism is a baffling condition and that people with autism suffer and don't fit in. And when I tried to write about why there was debate now in the autism communities in the world, whether that's people with autism or experts on autism, um, I started with two illustrations. And the first one was of my daughter, Isabel, who is uh, just brilliant at jigsaw puzzles but who also inexplicably always leaves one puzzle piece out of the puzzle. So it's never totally complete. And sometimes she hides it somewhere as well, so that nobody will come in and make that puzzle whole. Um, the second illustration that I used in talking about this puzzle piece was a famous poem by James Merrill called Lost in Translation, in which he describes himself as a child who, just like a puzzle piece, is trying to fit in to an ever-changing puzzle. For Meryl and for Isabel, I suppose, for all of us, there always seems to be a piece missing. Life, by definition, is always incomplete. The image we assemble of ourselves may seem real and coherent at any particular moment, but its shapes and meanings change constantly, perhaps like autism itself, a dynamic puzzle that evades, eludes any solution a whole that can never be whole. Now, certainly the communities into which autistic individuals are born today are different from those of the past. When so many people were given unhelpful diagnoses, like childhood schizophrenia, or mental retardation, or worse, and were often institutionalized, sometimes in brutal situations. It's better now, it's not. There's still brutality. There are still people who die in care, supposed care of um, group homes and other institutions. 
there was a time when restricted interests in social and communication difficulties were highly stigmatized. When mothers were highly stigmatized, blamed for their children's problems, and when schools and employers could offer few opportunities. While there is much more that needs to be done in support of people with a range of disabilities, the 21st century, particularly in Europe and North America, offers people with autism unprecedented possibilities. Just as Merrill's puzzle stands for the unstable relationship between the individual and the human condition in general, so too is autism an ever-changing assemblage of ideas and practices. An ever-changing assemblage that, perhaps like any social construct, is a set of relationships that is at once interlocking and intention. The meanings and values of autism as we now conceive it, like any construction in society, whether it's genetics or economics, changes constantly because societies change. What is so striking about the period in which we live now is how much diagnostic practices are driven by an economic logic. An economic logic that I'm going to argue makes autism hard to assail. We live in a time that is often called late capitalism, which I made an error in calling later capitalism. So please delete that law from your mind. Strike it, it's late capitalism. It's a time in which there is a new kind of structure linking various areas of social life. A structure defined by a philosophy or ideology that has yet another term, which is neoliberalism. Late capitalism is a temporal marker that describes a historical shift from industrialization to more flexible modes of work and more flexible modes of citizenship. Neoliberalism is not a temporal marker. It's associated with late capitalism. And it denotes the expansion of an economic logic or rationality into ostensibly non-economic spheres of life, such as when we uh, evaluate moral actions like charitable giving in terms of an economic logic, where a university privileges, uh, uh, say, the basic sciences and subordinates the humanities because the basic sciences will bring in more indirect research, cost money, and maybe lead to patents. Or when parents help to determine their children's course selection in college, away from Shakespeare or Russian literature to areas that might be more economically practical. So what has happened to autism during this time and under this kind of ideology? What's happened to it? There's very little written about autism within this broader economic context. Now, there's a lot written on the economics of autism, but it's like the costs of caretaking costs of employers? Uh, what is the lost productivity of people because of autism? What are the, Medicaid, uh, 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 the medical claims? Uh, what are the school requirements? How much do schools, uh, school programs cost? There's that kind of economic literature. There's tons of that. But what we don't know is how autism became such a valuable diagnosis in the sense I'm discussing, and particularly the degree to which a neoliberal logic shapes the production of knowledge, and what role autism plays in that, what role it plays in autism. <coughs> so missing is an explicit concern with how these costs are related to the question of how the concept of autism has changed and gained traction in recent years. There is an implicit assumption that most of the costs are new because there are more people with the diagnosis of autism today than ever before. And we hear politicians say, how would we pay for all these new cases of autism? This is an assumption that begs the question. It begs the question of whether the costs are new because the means of autism have changed. Leading to increased diagnosis, increased need for programs, or if the costs are new because there's actually an increase in problems. And I think some of you know, if you're familiar with anything, if you've heard me speak before, or if you're familiar with 
um, the book that Liz mentioned, you know my position is that there actually is very little evidence for an increase in autism uh, prevalence, but rather that the changes in our conception of autism have changed things, and I'll be talking more about that later. So the question I keep returning to is how is autism embedded in a series of relationships, many of them economic? One thing we know for sure is that autism has great power. And what does an anthropologist do fundamentally? He looks at things that have power, and he or she looks at things that seem real and fact-based and says, how did it get that impression of being real? How did we develop this notion that there's this real thing out there called autism? So what is this web of relationships? Well, think about the various ways in which autism has, uh, has power and popularity. In many memoirs, autism is defined as something that can constitute a person, or even possess a person, like a demon. There are parent memoirs in which people describe the child's soul as being abducted by an evil force. It can shape personhood, it can shape social identity, sometimes for good in the um, ways in which some people describe it, sometimes for bad. It's codified, it's written down, it's, it's, it's etched into a standardized vocabulary about human behavior, whether that's in the DSM or in the what are considered to be the gold standard diagnostic tools. It's the foundation of a wide range of institutions, and can even constitute a kind of culture, as for some self-advocates who say that autism is a way of being mediated through distinctive skills and challenges. <coughs> Once established, autism feeds an industry of therapists, complementary and alternative medicines, pharmaceuticals, special educators, group homes, and other facilities that are established and maintained by governments or nonprofit organizations. And the industry is necessitated by, requires, and produces new laws, new diagnostic screening tools, and screening tools, new forms of evidence and analysis, and even new forms of aesthetics. These new phenomena are supported by new sources of capital. They include philanthropists, advocacy organizations, schools, governments, research foundations, researchers, researchers in need of funding. The, it is remarkable how many researchers who never worked on autism before, in, in search of funding, now work on autism. Somebody spends their whole life studying the structure of the amygdala. Well, somebody says now the amygdala is associated with autism. Now that person considers himself an autism researcher never did before, but he does because that is where the funding is. It's like the, the, the drunk who looks for his keys under the lamppost, because that's where the light is. So autism may be imagined as a singular phenomenon, but it doesn't exist in isolation from this web of relationships, almost all of which have economic causes and consequences. I sympathize with the political theorist Timothy Mitchell from Columbia University who asks us to think of economics not just as a set of instruments of calculation and other technical devices, but as instruments and techniques whose strength lies not in their representation of an external reality, but in their usefulness for organizing socio-technical practices including knowledge and in their usefulness for making the things that we construct seem real and natural. The goal of the anthropologist, again, is not to confirm or deny the existence of a disorder, but rather, in the words of Alan Young, to explain how the disorder is made real, to describe the mechanisms through which the phenomena penetrate people's life worlds, acquire facticity, and shape the self-knowledge of patients clinicians, and researchers. If autism is to change, it has to be, in some way, disarticulated or freed from these bounded interests, whether to be eradicated as a concept or to radically change. The first step is to recognize and identify what these economic variables are. 
So let's talk a little bit about what's happened to autism, and I'll give you some statistics from the United States. All right? So in a recent paper, uh, Penn State researchers led by Polioff, um found no statistically significant change in the overall proportion of children in special education uh, in, a, in the United States. About uh, between 13 and 14 percent of all American school children in government schools, um, what we call public schools, um, is, um, uh, are receiving some kind of special education. Now that could mean anything from you know, intensive one-on-one -on -one care in schools, or it could mean extra time on an exam for a student who has attention issues. Between 1990 and 2016, both the number and percentage of students served under the law that requires the delivery of special education has varied between 11% and 14%. But both the number and percentage declined from 2004-05 school year through the 2011-12 school year. And the proportion of students served was lower in 2009 and 10, 2010-11, and 2011-12 than in any previous year, except going back to 2000. Yet, and this is the thing that's really very interesting, between 2001 and 2010-11, while the rate, the proportion of students in public schools receiving special education services remained static, the classification of autism as a proportion of these students increased by 331%. How is that possible that you have a static rate of special education, yet this enormous increase in people classified under the term autism? Much of the increase is attributable to the steady decline in the United States of other diagnoses such as intellectual disability and specific learning disability. And the rise of autism, traumatic brain injury, and other health impaired, OHI as we call it, as desirable categories in the United States. What makes these categories desirable is partly what they're not. A parent of a child with traumatic brain injury or autism does not want to suffer what they may believe is the indignity of the label of intellectual disability. The parent of a child with a rare, complex, genetic disorder may prefer autism because through that parsimonious category, the child joins an ever-widening group of peers and families and perhaps fits more neatly into a set of new programs. Poliak et al.'s study shows us that the category of autism now comprises a host of conditions of which symptoms of autism may be comorbid. And despite the fact that the DSM still considers autism idiopathic, as did Lee O'Connor and others, in actual practice, autism has become a primary diagnosis for many people whose symptoms have an identifiable etiology. In other words, Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, a range of, of congenital disorders in which autism becomes the primary marker. Never was before, but now a mental illness category is being used for people who never would have had a mental illness category. We need to think about what the costs and benefits of that may be. Boy, I sound like I'm using my own economic logic, don't I? I'm using the phrase costs and benefits. I shouldn't do that. Uh, the majority of public school children with autism in the United States, 60%, were identified using both school and non-school, that means private resources, at the same time, private therapy is not universally used since the far more flexible state and federal education codes and regulations used by the schools, but not the DSM, drive eligibility decisions. In one study in Atlanta, only 3% of children with autism, only 3% of children with autism were identified using solely non-school resources. The larger principle at work here is that where there is availability of school resources, so too will there be an increase in special education classifications 
So in the U.S., 13% of students receive some sort of special education service, while in a country like South Korea, which has a robust medical system and is the 12th largest economy in the world, but has a weak special education infrastructure, only 2% of students in their public schools, which is almost the entirety of the education there, receive special education services. 2%. Versus 13. And what is it in the UK? Does anybody know? Is it close to 14? Anyone know? 15. 15%. Okay. Let's uh, consider uh, Venezuela for a second. Uh, an epidemiologic study of children with ASD in Venezuela, based solely on medical records and school records, found a prevalence of 0.17% compared to the estimate of, say, New Jersey at 2.2%. Or my own estimate of South Korea in a study that we did there, 2.64%. Well, in the case of Venezuela, the likely underestimated rate of ASD is due to the combination of limited government resources, lack of awareness among professionals and parents that do not recognize that the behavior of their children is different or warrants some kind of category. Similar results have been found in other places in Latin America, like Ecuador, with a 0.11% prevalence rate, Brazil, with a prevalence of 0.27%. The fact that three different Latin American countries with very different levels of economic development have such low prevalence rates of ASD compels us to recognize that the need for special education and the delivery of services can be determined by a multitude of factors that have very little to do with any kind of scientifically validated disease. The special education industry has been huge. So too has the growth of child psychiatry. By the early 1970s and 1980s, child psychiatrists were few and far between. There were only a few hundred in the United States. The problem was more acute in rural and poor populations. Alaska, Alabama, Oklahoma, and Wyoming in, during the 2000s had fewer than four child and adolescent psychiatrists per 100,000 youth. In 2001, there were six child psychiatrists in Alaska, five child psychiatrists in Wyoming. And, you know, the sort of saying among parents there is if you get an appointment with a child psychiatrist, don't go, she must be lousy. But, um, of course, that doesn't work. You've got to take your appointment. Um, given the cost of psychiatric care, the highest rates of child specialization, and therefore the highest rates of child psychiatry diagnoses, were in the wealthiest states, and with those states where clinicians were concentrated in wealthy areas. And we see this borne out in the data that we have from looking at medical and school records. I mean, here's sort of a, 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 a graphic to help you a little bit. Let's, let's, let's call this the services area. So that's the schools and the hospitals. And if that's where we're going to find our cases, right? Now, in each of these boxes, we have 80 dots. Same number, right? 80 dots here, 80 dots here. Please don't count them. But I swear there are 80. <laughs> but uh, 80 here and 80 here. But we can't see these because there's no record of them. You can only count what you can see. So imagine that this is Alabama, which is a poor state with few services available to children with autism. Imagine that this is New Jersey, where you have a lot of services available and a lot of people in those services. You've got the same population and you have, this, uh, I mean, you have the same prevalence, uh, ideally, in this theoretical model in both of these places. Yet, if you start doing the counting, you'll find this has a high prevalence and this has a low prevalence. And in fact, that is what we see with Alabama at six times less, I guess I should state it in a positive way, uh, New Jersey with six time, five or six times greater prevalence of autism than in Alabama. And I just don't know anybody who seriously thinks that the proportion of people, the fraction of people in the state of Alabama is, 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 uh, with autism uh, is six times less than it would be in another state. 
Many other factors have to be considered. Advocacy organizations like Autism Speaks and the Autism Society of America have increased awareness dramatically and likely, therefore, also diagnoses of autism at earlier ages. Autism also increases as a primary diagnosis for children who reside in states where there are fiscal incentives to promote a greater number of diagnoses. Cullen, for example, demonstrated a link between fiscal incentives and a 40% growth in disability rates in Texas. And state and school criteria for autism diagnoses are generally much more lax, much more broad than DSM criteria. Kwok describes how in California, when they began to determine levels of special education funding on total enrollment, rather than the total enrollment of disabled students, special education classifications fell flat or fell, remained flat or fell. So diagnostic adjustments are possible given the great variability in diagnostic practices across the country. Furthermore, the increased attention to evaluating schools on the basis of educational testing measures may have also promoted greater numbers of school-based diagnoses of autism to exclude low-performing students from standardized tests. Finally, for, I'm, gonna, I'm just going through this list of different kinds of financial aspects of autism, there is special education litigation. Litigation specifically for autism-related services. The costs have, have yet to be studied, but what we do know from one study by Zirkel of a comprehensive sample of published court decisions, that children with autism accounted for about one-third of all published court decisions during special education during the first decade of the millennium. This rate is disproportional to enrollment of students with autism in special education programs, and this disproportionality has spanned the period of analysis and occurred across states with both high and low prevalence estimates. Now, the reasons for the disproportionality are not clear, but it's certainly conceivable that since autism-related services tend to be more expensive, than those for other disabilities, schools may decide to withhold services and parents may therefore be more likely to litigate if the services are being withheld. Anne McGuire, uh, among others, uh, has used the phrase uh, autism industrial complex. Anybody here familiar with the military industrial complex from basic education. That phrase came from U.S. President Dwight D. Eisenhower, who after leaving office in 1961, expressed concern about what he called the military-industrial complex, by which he meant the symbiotic relationship between the American military industry and, uh, and American industry, the U.S. military and American industry. And this intimate relationship between industry and military was not new, but what was new, what Eisenhower was, was really um, trying to get at was the explicit recognition that the symbiosis might insulate the military and its corporate partners from the normal operations of a competitive market, since that relationship was to a great extent shielded by the government, and therefore shielded by the actions and interests of the greater American public. Phrased differently, there was no new form of, there was no accretion of new forms of economic power, but a new emerging web of interconnected and bounded interests that changed the organization of economic power. The literature on autism similarly suggests that the costs, prevalence rates, numbers of programs, and so on, reflect a new reality. People feel that to be the case. For example, a true increase in the incidence of autism and new scientific <coughs> practice. I mean, why would there be so many new autism programs? Why would there be a 300% rise in autism school classifications if there were not more autistic people? But what if? What if what makes autism seem so real is the way it is embedded in our current time period? 
I've already said psychiatry is a set of representations that organize heterogeneous elements into specific practices like naming, definition, classification, treatment. But the most crucial point I want to make is that these organizing devices take on an often unanticipated power. Each new revision of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association is arguably motivated less by new scientific knowledge than by fiscal <coughs> imperatives, because it is the greatest source of revenue for the American Psychiatric Association. In other words, these bounded interests, like the industrial military complex, protect and shield a diagnosis from being interrogated and attacked and seen as a construction. Commenting on the autism industrial complex, McGuire notes that even the body of the autistic person is measurable in capitalist terms. She writes of the untimely body whose delays on so-called milestones generate a multi-billion dollar industry. And she writes, the Starbucks cop World Autism Awareness Day, and the sheer breadth of the autism industrial complex gesture toward the cultural fact that under neoliberal rules, social or economic investment in the untimely autistic child is not just an investment in the realization of the future citizen worker, but in the potential for its realization. In one unbroken and clearly very lucrative move, our market-driven times at once produce and regulate, create and constrain conduct that is beyond the norm. Well, this is no surprise. Our academic disciplines, our medical specializations emerge in certain contexts for certain reasons, and that is to order knowledge and to constrain us. The word discipline, the disciplines of sociology, history, anthropology, biology, these are disciplines. What does that mean, this word discipline? It means to control, to correct, to train human beings in the sense of organizing people and knowledge. So from Pinnell to Freud, to the current day psychiatry. The major difference in psychiatry is not new knowledge, but the new organization and governance of knowledge. The DSM does this, it formalizes, it controls. It is an underlying operation that we feel is real and it organizes the world in ways that seem to us to be natural and which are associated with the emergence of modernity and capitalism, like hospitals, schools, uh, prisons, and new ways of deciding what is normal and what is abnormal. The power of any disease construct is not out there in the open, obvious to us. It's enclosed within an ideology that simultaneously legitimates and masks it. So any particular psychiatric disorder becomes conceived not as a form of governance. It's not felt as a form of governance that guides human actions, but as a medical or scientific problem that needs to be addressed through medicine and science. One could make the argument that autism and other kinds of diagnoses have almost become fetishized sacred objects. Fetishized not in the sense of being sinister or sexual, or even in the religious sense, but fetishized in the sense of being something <coughs> singular, set apart, and whose conditions of being do not depend, no longer seem to depend on its similarity with other phenomena. It's set apart in a system of classification, experienced as real rather than constructed, and not seen as part and parcel of these larger bounded interests and systems. Marx, of course, talked about something that he said was, um, that he called commodity fetishism. It was in the uh, first part of his book, magisterial book, Capital. And Marx argued that money is fetishized as having real and objective value, even a life of its own, like when we say the stock market is bullish or bearish. We come to believe that something has an existence and we say, oh, the market liked this today, or the market didn't like this. Money operates like the market in an impersonal way, apart from the actions of human beings. And just as the value of money is self-evident to people in a market that's based on an economy that's based on markets and commodities, so too is autism made real by the activity that takes place around it. There is just too much at stake to threaten the integrity of autism. Consider, for example, the stubborn persistence of 
the concept of schizophrenia. Uh, are there any clinicians here who would describe schizophrenia as a split or divided mind? Probably not. That's not how we think of schizophrenia today. But that's what that word means. If we look at the word autism in other languages, it means selfism, trapped inside oneself, imprisoned within oneself, unable to come out. Uh, schizophrenia, that word's still with us, and it means split mind. And where did it come from? It came from Europe. It came from uh, both philosophical movements as well as scientific ones in order to describe, in order to offer evolutionary theories about what made people different. Why there were people who seemed crazy and why there were people who were not uh, like us. Like people who lived in Sub-Saharan Africa, who didn't have industrialized societies and who believed in many gods or who practice polygamy or whatever it was that was seen as unexplainable, or whether it was somebody who had hallucinations and thought he or she was God. And there was a theory that the mind would fragment in certain cases. Either that evolutionarily there was a degeneration from the pure form of the mind, from Adam and Eve, or that just normal human beings could have their mind disintegrated. And that's how we got human difference. And therefore, schizophrenia became a notion of a fragmented or split mind. And this then became replicated and reaffirmed through literature, through the, the, the whole um, uh, array of European uh, uh, great works that talked about there being two selves, whether it's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, or Faust, or Doppelganger, or the picture of Dorian Gray, or Frankenstein. This struggle between light and dark, good and bad, the divided mind. Now that's something from the 1700s and the 1800s, right? 2016. This is an advertisement in the American Journal of Psychiatry. And I know you might not be able to read this, but when he misses doses, his symptoms may not be far behind. And you can see that he's uh, a janitor, and he's sweeping the floor and the world is fracturing beneath him and it's going to divide him in two because he hasn't taken his medicine, which holds him together. Not perfectly, <coughs> it's fragile. And there's a kind of person here too. He's unshaven. His hair isn't that neat. He's not dressed in a, a way that suggests that he's a, a financial uh, a planner or a stockbroker. Uh, he's a blue-collar worker. He's a janitor. It not only tells us that this legacy of what schizophrenia is has stayed with us for all of these hundreds of years, but that even the kind of person that we imagine a person with schizophrenia to be, or to be able to be, has not changed. And by the way, that drug, uh, Risperdal, that was being advertised there, um, in 2007 alone, I think it brought in $4 billion, and then after 2012, when the generic competition came up, it still made $1.4 billion a year for Johnson & Johnson. Well, autism, so I'm going to start concluding now. Um, will autism uh, as a disease or disability exist 20 years from now? Maybe, maybe not. There will still be people who face enormous challenges communicating who have intellectual disabilities, who might not be able to take care of themselves. There will still be people with enormous skills, whether it's in this room or Silicon Valley or something, who, uh, who, who associate their great skills with autism. But we don't know if autism will be the organizing principle of how they define themselves. Autism is not completely shifted away from being a disease, despite the great efforts of autism self-advocates to produce the neurodiversity movement. But the expansion of the spectrum means that people with autism are now contributing to their communities in many ways, as loving family members, as employees, as entrepreneurs, as engineers, as psychologists, in a whole range of different ways. And the more this happens, the less suffering there will be, the less stigma there will be. And the less suffering and stigma there is, the less likely what we today call autism will even need a name. Already the writings of so many autistic individuals through the creative use of communication technologies have called into question what we thought autism was. They've shown empathy, which we didn't think autism involved. 
They've shown the ingenious use of metaphor and other literary tropes. They've shown a creative logic and rationality that shatters many of the assumptions about so-called cognitive impairments. And they've challenged us to see similar abilities in people who are not able to express themselves yet to the same degree. As a sign of the movement from disease to citizenship, autism advocacy is now following in the footsteps of other advocacy movements, such as that for breast cancer or AIDS. It's following in the footsteps of these advocacy movements by challenging authority, by engaging in a contest about who has the authority to define and interpret one's experience. And one example of this, to return to the puzzle piece that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, um, is, um, is the, the fact that a word has meaning. It's a symbol. Autism is a symbol. The public puzzle piece is a symbol. And symbols can be very powerful. So in this context, to fight about the meanings of autism, it is no surprise that many people are latching on to the puzzle piece and saying, you know, it's in microcosm, what is the argument about how we represent ourselves and who has the authority to do it? Ironically, the word symbol comes from the ancient Greek symbolic, which meant to make whole. So, like when you give a ticket at a, um, uh, 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 and, and then it's ripped, and you have a, um, you, have, you have half a ticket because uh, somebody's ripped the stub. Um, and so uh, that's where the word symbol comes from. And so it really meant to put together or to make whole. And it referred to the inferences we have to make from incomplete information. Similarly, although each piece of a jigsaw puzzle is unique, the desire to work on a puzzle presupposes both that the pieces will interlock and that we know what that finished puzzle is going to look like, usually the picture on the outside of the box the puzzle came in. But for autism, that hole is now being contested. That hole is up for grabs. For many researchers, the hole is some kind of coherent scientific knowledge that explains, treats, cures autism. For some advocates, however, the whole is actually a definition of normalcy or neurotypicality that should be resisted. In the view of these advocates, the incomplete puzzle represents a deficit model of autism. It suggests that there's something missing in people with autism, and that the completed puzzle or cure will mean the destruction not only of their personhood, but of what autistic traits give to humanity, which is creativity and diversity. Indeed, self-advocates may very well identify more with the puzzle piece itself than with the puzzle, and argue that they're best represented as a piece that will never and should never fit in. Still other advocates see the imagined puzzle to which the piece belongs as society at large, and the lone separated piece as a representation of autistic isolation. And for them, that image really challenges their experience. It denies the existence of an autistic sociality at a time when advocates are working so hard to demonstrate that people with autism do build and do maintain meaningful social relationships and even new social identities, including relationships with animals and relationships in virtual communities that are established over the internet. This contest is a good sign because it shows that people on a spectrum are resisting this protection of the concept of autism that is so embedded in our time and so protected by the economic forces that have reaffirmed it, continue to reaffirm it. The contest is a sign of citizenship, too, of participation in shaping the future. And the contest shows us that autism is dynamic, that it is a construct, so it can change. It could be eliminated, even. In both accepting and resisting particular definitions or images of autism, we acknowledge that even if our abilities to speak, to communicate, to think, to act, could be reduced to nature, to biological materials and mechanisms, the meanings and experiences of autism are of our own making. So when we say that autism is a construct of our own making, it's saying one thing, pure and simple which is that we have the power to change it. Thank you very much. <laughs>